Samarpan means offering. Offering of what? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, four things is what I want you to offer to me. Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam. I want leaf, I want flower, I want fruit, and I want holy water. Very easy to give these because available in the market. And that's what is sold outside most temples. But what is the inner significance of Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam? If it was so easy to buy it, why did Krishna tell Arjuna that I want these four things? And Swami has given the inner significance. What is Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam? Patram means your body. I want you to dedicate your body. Pushpam means your feelings. I want you to dedicate your feelings. Phalam means Mano Phalam, your mind. I want you to dedicate your mind to me. And Toyam, holy water means the bliss, the joy that emanates from your heart when we see Swami's beautiful form, when we experience His love, that is the holy water that He wants us to offer to Him. That is the true Samarpan. Swami was just coming for darshan. They stood up on their knees with two letters in their hand and said, Swami, we are your new MBA students. Immediately Swami looked at them and said, Nobody is new. All are old. We have been with him over so many lifetimes and he has groomed us, chiseled us and empowered us to be a part of this unique divine mission of universal transformation. my most humble, loving and reverential pranams at the Divine Lotus feet. It is all Bhagwan's grace that we are what we are in our personal, professional and spiritual lives. I guess the attempt and the constant endeavor that we need to make is to continuously progress in this journey with Sai and to Sai. The theme at the Samarpan series of talks is to share personal experiences with Bhagwan. And I'll make an attempt at recollecting and sharing those experiences and more importantly, the insights that Swami always wanted us to learn from each of those experiences. I guess the insight part is even more important because that is the learning we carry forward with us in our spiritual journeys. So let me go back in time. It was August 2001, as Brother Lakshmi Khan shared. I was a part of the youth wing at the Sri Satisai Seva organization here in Mumbai, very active in Dharmakshetra, used to come here every weekend. And at that time I had this desire to go to Prashantinilayam and study MBA in Swami's university. The problem was that the entrance exam at Prashantinilayam used to always overlap with the final exams at Mumbai University. Both of those used to typically be in the month of May. And hence, one would have had to wait for a year so that one can attempt the entrance exam at Prashantinilayam because you have to finish the previous exam at Mumbai University. And I was not willing to wait for one more year to go to Prashantinilayam. So I did what we all do, wrote a letter to Swami, praying to him. And we all know what all kind of requests we used to make to Swami. So I too made a request, Swami. This is the problem. My entrance exam and final exams are overlapping. Please do something because I wish to be a part of the university's MBA program. This was sometime in September 2001. I had sent a letter with one of the Balvikas gurus from Mumbai. And Swami very lovingly accepted the letter. And in October 2001, I got a message from the college that for the first time in the history of Mumbai University, the final exams were advanced. We usually are aware of postponements of exams with most of the university examination schedules. But here for the first time, instead of the exams being in May, the exams were advanced to March. And I could give the exams, I could go to Prashantinilayam and write the entrance exam on the 9th of May 2002. 
I still remember the day when I had entered the portals of Swami's college campus in Prashantinilayam and uh, I'd written the, and wrote the exam there. It was more like homecoming. I was feeling that I have finally come home. Exams were over, went off well, was always praying that I should get through the written exam, the group discussions, the personal interview, the rigorous admission procedure that Swami's university always follows. And four days later, I get the information on phone that I have been selected for the MBA program and my name was in the top of the list, in the list of candidates selected for the, for the final MBA course. So my joy knew new bounds and I was delighted that very soon I will be in Prashantinilayam. But the second part of the message was that you are expected to be in Vrindavan day after tomorrow because the summer course in Indian culture and spirituality is just beginning. And so in a matter of 36 hours, I packed my bags, said goodbye to all my relatives and fellow devotees in Mumbai and moved to Vrindavan, Swami's ashram in Bangalore. I still remember it was the 13th of May 2002 and as per the Indian almanac, it was the Prathama of the Shukla Paksha of the month of Vaishakha. I'll tell you later as to why I'm quoting the Indian almanac along with the English date. The journey to Swami had begun that day on 13th of May 2002. Now let me take you to a flashback so that I can present my experiences in a particular series. I've made an attempt to capture the 12 years that I could spend in Prashantinilayam in Swami's physical and divine presence and how that relationship with Swami is built every single month such that we progress in our spiritual journey is the attempt I'll be making in my talk today. So way back in 1980, it was the April 1980, my maternal grandparents and my mother had got an interview in Vrindavan. And in, that, and in that interview, Swami blessed my mother that she will have a son a year later. She had he had materialized Vibhuti and given to my mother. And my mother was keeping it for my father, as is always. The wife is so dutiful, she'll always like to share the prasad with the husband. And then Swami said, no, no, this is for you. Ye tumhare liye hai. Kha jao, kha jao. He said three times, eat it, eat it. And so my mother ate the Vibhuti Prasadam. And exactly a year later, in April 1981, on a Thursday, I was born. Being the only son, my parents, especially my father, had this desire that I should get international experience, international qualifications, because that's what is the order of the day in most metropolitan cities. So he always wanted me to go to America and study business there in one of the Ivy League schools. And so, because my maternal grandparents were in USA, they had applied for a green card or the immigrant status as it is called. In 1997, we got that. And I started visiting US every year during the summer vacations to get exposed to the education system and to America. But being a Sai devotee, I always made it a point to visit the retreats that used to happen there in the summer season. Now what is a retreat? A retreat is a time where all Sai devotees from that region get together and they spend three days in a place as a community and spend the entire day like it is in Prashantinilayam. From Suprabhatam to night prayer, every part of the day is celebrated as if it is in Prashantinilayam. And there, they used to have speakers who came from Prashantinilayam and also a part of the organization to address the devotees. And I still remember in 1998, when I was there for the retreat, Sri Vedanarayan, who is the teacher of Sanskrit language in Swami school in Prashantinilayam, had come. And for over three to four hours, he shared brilliant experiences, wonderful experiences, hitherto unheard experiences of Swami's love for his students. It was then that this desire developed in my heart that I don't want to study in America, I want to study in Puttaparthi. Usually the journey to Prashantinilayam starts in America and via Bombay goes to Prashantinilayam. My journey to Prashantinilayam started from Mumbai took me to America and from America brought me to Prashantinilayam. I used to visit America often 
And there, every single retreat, I continued to get interesting experiences and insights heard from these speakers. One of them was Dr. Jagdishan, who was from Malaysia, who shared as to how youth can play a very important role in the organization. And he said that you must be a part of the youth wing. I said, yes, I will be a part of the youth wing. And in my heart, I said, Swami, if I do well in my exams, I'll be a part of the youth wing. You know how we always have these small little prayers in our heart. That Swami, if I do well in this, this will happen. I will do this. If you do this, I will do this. And the young, young uh, adolescent teenager that I was, I said, Swami, if I stand first in my examinations, I will join the youth wing of the Satsai Seva organization, Mumbai. And believe me, brothers and sisters, that year, it was my 12th board examination. I not only stood first in my uh, college, I stood first among 20 colleges of the Hyderabad Sin National Collegiate Board, and also I stood in the top 10 of the merit list in Mumbai. So Swami had let, left no excuses. He said, your time is now ready to be an active member of the youth wing. I cannot forget those three years I spent at Dharmakshetra between 99 and 2002. Nimishankal, Ramesh Ankal, Dr. Mistri. That time it, there was Radha Prabhakaran, Radha Aunty, Kamakshi Aunty. They were all very, very active in grooming the youth into responsible members of the Sai fraternity. It was here in Dharmakshetra <clears throat> that I learned the first sentences of spirituality. And as Brother Lakshmi Khan shared, the... Yes magazine, Youth in Eternal Seva, and the festival of song, dance, and drama. These were the first set of activities we had begun. And these were very, very important in grooming us in team building, in leadership, and in selfless service. Finally, I could convince my father that year that I should be permitted to go to Prashant Nilim for MBA and not in US. And he agreed, and my journey to Prashant and Liam began. It was the 14th of May 2002, as I said. Now we are back from flashback to real time. It was the 14th of May 2002. We all were sitting in, Prashant, in Brindavan, in the Sai Ramesh Hall. And two of my classmates, I remember their names, Shyam Sundar and Vishwanath. Swami was just coming for darshan. They stood up on their knees with two letters in their hand and said, Swami, we are your new MBA students. Immediately, Swami looked at them and looked at all other students sitting there, the new ones especially, and Swami said, nobody is new. All are old, old students. Such a simple sentence, but so insightful in its message that we think that we have come to Swami for the first time. We think that, I think that my journey with Swami began that day, and that's why I'm sharing the date. We think that from this lifetime we know and we are associated with Swami and his work and his mission. But it is not that way. Swami has always said time and again that we have been with him over so many lifetimes and he has groomed us, chiseled us and empowered us to be a part of this unique divine mission of universal transformation. So many experiences that I will be sharing, but I would like to give this context so that we understand this ecosystem that Swami's university provided. We joined Swami's hostel in Prashantanilayam, and for those who haven't been to Prashantanilayam uh, in the Vidyagiri side, that hostel resembles a massive palace, over 100 rooms, three floors, so many variety of facilities. I was overwhelmed when I first came because I didn't know what to see and what to explore. In fact, when I came back 12 years later home, I used to tell my mother, Mommy, this home in Mumbai looks so small. I'm used to that building with 100 rooms. She said, yeah, right. We're going to get 100 rooms in Mumbai now. That is the kind of facility and infrastructure that Swami provided. And then the classes began. What is it to be a Sai student? How does this journey with Swami begin when you are a fresher in Prashant in Ilayam? I still remember our classes used to end at 2.20. Used to start at 8 o'clock. Of course, the schedule starts much earlier at 5.20 with Suprabhatam and then jogging and then breakfast. And then we leave for classes where it begins with prayer. But 2.20, the classes end. 
invariably, and I myself have been a teacher, so I know, we tend to take five, ten minutes extra. But then, whenever the teacher used to take five minutes extra time, our attention used to be continuously going to the clock. It's 2.22, it's 2.25, and by the time it is nearing 2.30, the students would almost revolt and get up and say, Sir, we have to go to Mandir for Darshan. We used to head, literally dash to the hostel, just keep our books in the room, no tea, no coffee, no milk, we wouldn't be interested in anything, grab our mandir mats and rush into the entrance of the hostel to stand in the line to go to mandir. It used to be by classes, every class used to get an opportunity to leave first to go to mandir and as the lines would begin, the walk from the hostel to the mandir was like a 10 minute walk, 7 to 10 minutes walk. With every passing building, the speed of the students walking in the line to the mandir would increase. By the time we reached Ganesh gate, it was as if the magnet had sucked the iron filings. We used to literally throw our slippers, though our teachers would repeatedly tell us to keep them in an order. We used to literally throw our slippers and run to the mandir to catch that first row seat so that we can sit right in front of Swami, just three steps away from where his chair would be kept. Not only that, we used to then go to the bhajan hall and keep mats there, so that as soon as Swami gets up from the Kulvant hall and goes inside the bhajan hall, we can run from the opposite side and go and sit in front even in the bhajan hall. One fine day what happened, instead of coming to the darshan uh, in the Kulvant hall, Swami went inside the bhajan hall and there all over the bhajan hall, all these mats were kept, the darshan mats that we used to carry. And Swami looked around with, with a lot of amazement on his face. He said, Amity, the railway platform. What is this? Is this a railway platform? You know how railway platforms are with all the luggage and all these things kept all over. And then they said, no, Swami, these are the mats. He said, yes, I know. I know that they do advance booking so that they can get first line darshan in both places. What was so special of running to Mandir, whether it is a student or a devotee, we all have stood in lines for hours together. And I had valued the first line darshans when I was a student because as a devotee I used to sit right at the end of Kulvant Hall because of the thousands that would gather there. I still remember for the 80th birthday of Swami, my late maternal grandfather, Professor C. H. Shah and myself stood outside Hillview Stadium for four hours from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. before we could get in. But even at the ripe age of 80, he was there, 75th birthday for Swami, 80th birthday for him, he was there standing in line. What is the power of darshan? What is unique about darshan? We all relate Swami to his miracles. We all relate Swami to his omniscience. But what is the distinguishing feature of divinity? The distinguishing feature of divinity is the power of his presence and the experience of divine love in that presence. Valmiki, Vasishtha, Vishwamitra, Vedavyasa, all great sages who have done superhuman feats for the benefit of mankind, they had and could do all kinds of miracles. They had all kinds of omniscience omnipotence and omnipresence related powers but still they yearned again and again to be in the physical presence of the avatar of Rama and Krishna. The reason being the extraordinary experience of bliss and love in the powerful physical presence of the avatar and it was no different for our master whom we loved to be in his physical presence and so it was with the Gopalas, with Krishna, so it was with the monkeys, with Rama, and so it is with us devotees and students in Swami's physical presence. As the famous poet William Wordsworth had said, bliss it was in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was verily heaven. In this sentence, I would like to capture my experience as a young Sai student in the MBA class. It was around that time in June 2002, I got a dream and a strange one at that. All of us new students were sitting with Swami and Swami was sitting on a chair and I was there in the first row. And Swami was asking each one of us, where have we come from, what are we doing in that dream? 
And then my turn came. And even before I could say something, Swami said, this boy, he was going to go to Harvard University. But he gave up that opportunity because he wanted to study in my university. Now he has joined the MBA program and he is going to be in Prashantinilayam. When I got up that morning after seeing the dream, I was wondering what it actually meant. But it took me 12 years to realize what it meant. And I'll tell you as I proceed today, what was the inner significance of that dream. The journey continued and now we come for some experiences. Convocation drama before President Abdul Kalam, visits to Kodai Canal, speeches in the Divine Presence. All of these were wonderful opportunities that I experienced and I would like to share some of them. Because Lakshmi Khan said so much about speeches, I'd like to put a caveat. With Swami, there are no favorites. We apparently feel and he makes us feel that we are favorite. The moment, and I see Dr. K.K. Mistri smiling here, the moment it gets into our head that we are favorite, the tumbling down the hill begins. But yes, I can say one thing. He definitely gives us a lot of opportunities to live up to his expectations so that we can make ourselves happy with our performance and make him happy with our offering. So this was in the Diwali vacation in October 2002. Diwali vacation used to be a wonderful time at Prashantinilayam. We used to get lots of opportunities. One of the opportunities was Purnachandra session. You can sit, uh, you, you have an opportunity to sit around Swami and Swami will share lots and lots of things, materialize things, have students speak before him. Or we used to have movie shows with Swami. You can imagine watching a movie with Swami. But what movies? Swami used to have all these great devotees' lives shown as movies to us, whether it is Mirabai, whether it is Sakubai, whether it is Bhakta Prahalada, or it is the lives of Rama and the Bhagavatam. But the most important thing was, while well, the movie used to go on on one side, Swami used to continue to give parallel commentary and share incidences from the lives of all those great devotees and avatars which were not even included in the movie. And then the best of the opportunity used to be to be a part of the convocation drama. Because if you're in the convocation drama, you definitely have a visa to at least 10 to 12 interviews. So you want to be in the drama because you will get interviews. So that particular year, I was in for a surprise. It was 18th of October 2002. I was getting ready to go to Mandir and someone came running. Swami is calling you. You can imagine, you have just come back from some work, you are getting ready to go to Mandir and the call comes, Swami is calling you. I literally dashed to the Mandir in the auto, we were not expected to take the auto, but in certain emergency situations, we go in the auto to Mandir. And there, the registrar, the erstwhile registrar of the university, Professor Lakshmi Narasimham was there near the, uh, near the Krishna statue side, where the old students now sit. He said, Babu, Babu is a nice way of telling a younger student, like we in Telugu, my dear child, like that. That's the equivalent. So he said, Swami has selected you to give a talk today. Then he continued, he said, this morning, Swami had asked that from today, two students will give speeches every day. So the registrar and the warden submitted, Swami, students are not ready. Please give them some time. So I said, yes, sir, why did you suggest my name for the first day? So the, reward, the registrar said, I did not give your name. Swami said, students are ready. There is one fair boy from Bombay. He is ready to give the talk. You call him this evening to give a talk. So I was intrigued as to what this fair boy meant, what this Bombay boy meant and what this readiness to give talk meant. And even before I could... Uh, comprehend these three points of Swami's one sentence, I realized that I had rushed to Mandir with a half sleeve shirt. The tradition in Prashantinilayam is that for most public programs and in fact always as far as possible, you should wear a full sleeve shirt. And there is a science behind it and we, we, it would be wonderful to read the scriptures and understand that as much as the body is covered, that much of our internal vibrations are preserved. And so, I was, I was thinking as to how will I get my full sleeve shirt from hostel. Now there is a story to this as well. One month before this incident, I had a dream from Swami. In the dream, Swami said, 
why are you wearing half sleeve shirts to mandir now the problem is i was never used to wearing full sleeve shirts being from mumbai in fact i used to always insist to my mother that i don't want to wear full sleeve shirts it's very hot here it's not very comfortable so i i thought swam i thought it was an aberration swami is mentioning about half sleeve shirt why should swami take the time to come and mention to me in my dream about half sleeve shirt so i just brushed it aside two weeks later again i get a dream again swami said the same thing i told you two weeks back to wear half sleeve shirt to wear full sleeve shirt why are you still wearing half sleeve shirt so immediately that day morning i got up and gave two shirts or rather four shirts to the tailor in prashant nilayam for stitching into full sleeve shirts a stitch in time saves nine as they say it was literally that for me because two weeks later i had the surprise opportunity of speaking for the first time in swami's physical presence i rushed my classmate to the hostel he got the shirt i wore it and i was sitting right in the first line when swami came for darshan he looked at me at as if literally inspecting me whether i am dressed properly for the occasion with the full sleeve shirt and then smiled and said bombay one word three second look whole message communicated a week later two to two to talks every day continued a week later swami wanted uh, uh, the talks to conclude because the college was going to begin and there i was sitting every day ahead because i knew my chance is over so i was not going to call me again so with all that confidence i was sitting of course with full sleeve shirt now i was sitting there in the fifth or seventh row and two students were identified for that day they spoke rather the first student was finishing and the second student started and there through the te- almost 10 rows away swami looked at me and nodded his head now being new to the system i didn't know what this nodding of head means because swami looked at me and nodded his head i also looked at swami and nodded my head <laughs> not knowing what i was getting into so <clears throat> he called me he he the, uh, then he smiled and nodded his head again and then after that second speaker finished he called me like this from the 10th row now something i would like to share here we usually think if we are sitting in the first row it's only then when we can see swami and swami can see us well actually from where swami used to sit and later years when i had opportunity to sit behind swami on duty swami can see clearly almost till the 50th row pinpointing who is sitting there so that myth was broken that sitting close makes you more visible to swami and hence he will call you so i went to swami and then there was a surprise he said baat karta hai now swami used to always speak like shirdi baba in these phrases he said baat karta hai so in my innocence and ignorance i asked swami not knowing exactly that that means that you should give a talk i asked swami kon baat karta hai swami <laughs> then immediately the ward and dr shivashankar sai jumped to my rescue from behind he said then he is whispering you can imagine swami is talking to me i am facing swami and from behind swami dr shishankar sai is trying to communicate swami is telling whether you will give a talk this when i realized that the nodding of head meant are you ready <laughs> so i said okay swami i will give a talk then he said acha jao baat karo then i got up and went even before i moved ahead he again said come here i then again kneel down in front of swami he said lekin tumhara naam announce nahi kiya hai tum kaise baat karega then again in the innocence that i had i said swami you only called me from the 10th row i have not come here on my own if you want i'll go back and sit down and swami started smiling because i gave such a frank response swami wanted to see he always appreciates innocence because you don't have a facade when you are talking to your guru to the master to our god so i went and spoke after i spoke he asked me to sing a song and i managed that and then he was going back <clears throat> after darshan and then he told some of the teachers he said see the boy whom i selected spoke as good as then in, again he said even better than the students you spoke my choice is better than yours he smiled and moved ahead with that joke to the teachers one of them came back and told me this is what swami said i was wondering swami rarely compares students but what was the message later i realized that that was the way swami used to encourage young students 
you can imagine the opportunity of speaking in the presence of 10000 people in that sai kulwant hall at a notice of 10 seconds for an unknown period of time if you ask swami swami how long should i speak he said go and talk i will tell you when to stop so you have no advance notice of any kind many years later once in kodaikanal swami said why do you speak so softly gattiga maatladu speak with force speak with confidence that is the sign of a sai student so these were the kind of training points that he used to give at different parts of that journey one and a half years later it was sankranti 2004 january swami the sports meet was over and we were sitting there again i was in the 15th row or somewhere and then swami all of a sudden called me from there every time swami used to call me from the 15th row invariably someone from the 5th row used to get up and start walking towards swami and swami said no not you sit down that boy behind so i went to swami then swami said i will you talk i said yes swami then he paused then he said what are they chanting then i paused for a few seconds vedam was going on vedam chanting was going on i said swami they are chanting brahmananda valli from the taitare upanishad it's a famous verse almost about 30 40 couplets then swami paused for a second and with a twinkle in his eyes he said brahmananda valli or atmananda valli just one crisp sentence it took me a decade to understand when i was reading the shankar bhashyams where shri adi shankara says brahma satya jagan mithya jeevo brahmaiva na paraha there is no difference between the individual atma and the supreme brahma when swami asked me whether it is brahmananda valli or atmananda valli he communicated that point that the ananda which the atma can give is the ananda which the brahma tattva is wanting to give that is the way swami has communicated simple simple stories now something humorous this was april 2004 and you can see i'm literally rattling out my autobiography which i rarely do but there was an insistence that in samarpan programs it has to be your personal experiences and so i thought what better way to share my journey through each of these landmarks it was 2004 i had finished my mba program i was sitting i was working uh, in brindavan ashram in the vacation time you get opportunities to work in the book stall in the memorabilia stall in the canteen in so many places so i selected to work in the memorabilia stall where they used to sell swami's key chains photographs vibhuti packets so one devotee came that day and uh, he said she said i want two vibhuti packets so i gave her two vibhuti packets it was 2 rupees that time 2 into 2 4 rupees i said aunty 4 rupees then after giving me the money she was looking behind uh, the vibhuti packet and she asked what is the expiry date of this vibhuti so then i looked at her not expecting this question ever in my life because we are sai devotees i said madam this vibhuti has no expiry date this vibhuti is symbolic of our expiry date she was almost shocked at the temerity that this young looking student had to tell her back that the vibhuti is symbolic of our expiry date we had seen this beautiful video of swami materializing vibhutis in different ways and formats whether it is shivratri guru purnima or the regular darshan what is the inner significance of vibhuti vibhuti basically means ash ash is the last stage of our human existence when we all pass away and today a very dear samiti member and devotee from south mumbai fort samiti vrunda aunty passed away every such incident reminds me that vibhuti is symbolic of our last stage when all the five elements merge back into the five elements by applying that vibhuti every day on our forehead it is a reminder that this is the ultimate stage of our existence and hence everything we do should be in that awareness that ultimately i am going to become this then why at all should i go beyond what my dharma tells me to do 8th of april 2004 a memorable day in my life 
I was late for bhajans that day. I literally dashed to the Sai Ramesh Hall. And the, the rule is that before Swami comes onto the bhajan stage, the students are expected to be there, in fact, much before. But that day I got delayed in my duty. I came and sat in the last row. Swami came, sat on the podium. And right from the time he sat there, for the next half an hour, Swami kept on looking at me. Now, when, devotee, when Swami looks at devotees, they're delighted. Oh, Swami is looking at me again and again. I'm indeed blessed. If Swami looks at students once or twice, they are also delighted that, oh, Swami is looking at me. But if Swami keeps looking at students for a long time again and again in a particular darshan, then students are literally concerned because that means that you have done something wrong and your mind races back to all your actions for the last two, three weeks, two, three months, whenever the last interaction with Swami has been, to tell you what are the mistakes that you may have made. A self-audit begins. At that time, I did not know what it meant. I got up. I mean, I was sitting there, then uh, Swami left. There was this uh, Thrai session that day. Thrai session is you get to sit inside. Uh, the photo there at the rear end of Swami sitting in Jula is of the Thrai Vrindavan session. And just right where Swami's feet end, all the students sit there. And there is a beautiful one and a half hour long interaction where Swami talks, sings, we sing, we talk, everything imaginable in terms of opportunities happens. So my line got selected that day first and I landed up in the fourth row. I landed up in the fourth row there and imagine first sitting in the last row I was concerned, now I was sitting in the first row right in front of Swami. And I was wondering what's going to happen. Swami sits there and first he comes, sits on the chair, on the jula, calls me. I have a letter in my hand. He takes the letter. He looks at the letter. He asks, my name is written there, Shashank. So he says, what is the meaning of Shashank? I said, Swami, moon. He said, oh, moon. He, Swami said, there is one more meaning. Do you know that? I said, no, Swami. He said, Shashank means velturu, light in Telugu. Not hot sunlight cool, soothing moonlight. You should be like what your name is. Then in that letter I had written, Swami, today is my birthday. So he read the first sentence, Swami. I had written there, Swami, today is my birthday. So Swami repeated, today is my birthday. Oh, it is your birthday today. He looked at me and said, I said, no, Swami, not today. I showed him the date on top. I said, Swami, that day was my birthday. That day I wrote this letter to you and now I'm having an opportunity to present to you. Then he said, oh, it is your birthday. What gift did your mother give you? I said, Swami, my mother gave me blessings. Then Swami said, but she is in Bombay. You are in Bangalore. How did she give you blessings? I said, Swami, I called her up. Oh, phone pay blessings diya. Very good. Then he said, today is your birthday. Why don't you share your thoughts with your brothers? So now... From last row to fourth row, fourth row to letter, letter to getting Vibhuti, much less Vibhuti and gave me and then from giving speech. And even as I began to give my speech, I reminisced an incident which my classmates had said a month ago that when you get, to get a chance to speak next, you must share this incident. Now this was March of 2004. It is a tradition, in, at least in those years in Prashantanilayam, that the passing out batch, the graduating batch of students, gives some token of appreciation to Swami, as gratitude. So that year we decided that for two full years, Swami had stopped wearing colored robes. He used to wear only orange. No yellow for Guru Purnima Janmashtami, no white for birthday and Christmas, no maroon for convocation. So we thought it will be a nice opportunity to give Swami colored robes to remind him that Swami, you have stopped wearing colored robes. We want you to see in colored robes. So we gave those three robes, uh, we nicely packed it, our gratitude letters and our warden with a few students went to Swami's mandir. And there Swami took those set of letters and he sent a message, I don't want robes, tell the boys, if they want robes, I will give them robes. So we were all very upset. Why did Swami not accept our gift? We are back in the room, 10, 12 of us. There's a dormitory system in Swami's hostel. 12 of us stay together. It's a great exercise in community living. We were all discussing that day before dinner. Why did Swami not accept our gift? Then I said, Swami wants to give us robes. Let him give. We will give our parents to keep in the altar. 
it will be a great gift. So one of my students said, why don't you go and tell Swami in the mandir tomorrow that you want robe? So I said, why should I tell Swami in the mandir? I pointed at Swami's photograph in the room. I said, Swami is here. His photograph is here. I'm telling Swami, Swami, please give all of us robes so that we can give it to our parents. We went, the, the dinner bell rang. We went for having dinner. Next day, morning, Swami used to go to hospital many times on a round. Swami comes near the hostel, stands, calls for the warden and says, today, let all the students come to mandir early. When Swami says that, irrespective of our duties, everybody will rush to mandir in time. That day afternoon when we went to mandir, all over the portico, there were at least 1200 robes. Swami had piled up 1200 robes for distributing to all the students, all the staff members. And after the distribution was over, I was sitting in the 10th line, Swami was standing there, he looked at me in the 10th line, again smiled and nodded his head. As if happy, I have listened to your prayer. And from where I was sitting, I folded my hands in acknowledgement and gratitude. It didn't end there. I came back to hostel. My classmate said, oh, what we were speaking in, Mandir, in the hostel yesterday, Swami heard and today he is given robes to all of us. Why don't you share this experience next time when you get a chance to speak in front of Swami? I said, okay, I will share. This was going on in my mind when I stood up that day in Trai Brindavan to talk before Swami and invariably I narrated this experience. I finished the experience and some other experiences, bowed down in front of Swami and went to sit down and Swami told a set of students sitting in the first row, Swami said, I knew this boy will talk about the robe, that's why even before coming down, I have told Satyajit to keep the robes ready. Because Prashant Nilayam got ro boys got robes in Prashant Nilayam, Brindavan boys were left out. All Brindavan boys and those who are here will get robes today. When Dr. Ravi Kumar, who is now the warden of the hostel, went upstairs, he saw robes were piled up there upstairs in Swami's residence. And Swami distributed robes to all and the first person he called was me and gave me a robe with his hand. What is the insight from this experience? We always think that we need to communicate something to Swami in His physical presence. We know that Swami is listening to us when we are talking to Him in the altar, but it is a theoretical knowledge, it's not practical knowledge. And we think that the Swami in the photograph and the Swami in person is a different entity. This experience convinced me that the Swami in the photograph, the Swami in person, and the Swami in person but at a distance reading your thoughts and your prayers is the same entity. What is the second learning? We, I think that I came late, I think that I got first row, I think that Swami called me, I think that Swami made me speak, I think that Swami, I, I think that I uh, spoke about the robe. He had already decided even before that day's bhajan session started that today he is going to distribute the robes. He had already identified his instrument. It was only for the instrument to learn through those series of events that it is he who is doing that's why Krishna had mentioned to Arjuna, Nimitta Matram Bhavasavyasachi. Oh, Savyasachi, ambidextrous one, just be my instrument. It is I who am doing everything. You are only executing what I am willing that you should do. A year later, I was in MPhil. It was the 26th of January 2005. Again, those, one of those speech experiences. Two weeks earlier, on the 11th of January, I fell down from almost a table of about 9 to 10 feet height. It was the sports meet day and uh, I was putting up some props on top of the table just before the event was to begin. Swami was already sitting on the stage and then there was some delay in setting up the prop. So I got onto the table, which was not my job, but I went there, I was doing it, and in my hurry of doing it, I did not see the edge of the table, and I fell down on my back, down 10 feet, almost even higher than that, somewhere halfway through that pillar. I fell down on my back in the open uh, Hillview Stadium. Just as I fell down, the music began and the program started. I immediately went behind the scene. Many of my classmates later on were joking that you acted as the coconut breaking ceremony before the program started. I was bleeding profusely, the lower part of my body, especially near the thighs, the heels and the ankles. 
limping, I reached the stage, went to hostel, fell severely sick, went to the doctor, they took a lot of x-rays, and they said, you have been saved by Swami's grace because you would have had a spinal injury. Luckily, there has been a small injury in, in the lower part of your spine, which is more at the muscular level, not at the bone level, the spine level. You need to take rest, you'll be fine. I was resting in the hostel for almost two weeks. It was 26th of January, the Republic Day. I did not even go for Republic Day celebrations. In Swami's university, we have flag hoisting every day morning. Every, every Republic Day, Independence Day morning, Swami expects students to be committed to patriotism and nationalism and salute the national flag, which is symbolic of the sacrifices of so many freedom fighters. My family has had the privilege of fighting for India's freedom and even courting arrest and spending many months or even years in jail during Quit India movement. But that day I didn't go because I didn't have the strength, strength to stand for 15 minutes for the flag hoisting and the subsequent talk. But that evening I thought, let me at least go and have Swami's darshan. I have not gone for many days. So I went for darshan. Again, I was sitting somewhere in the 10th row. Swami came, sat down. Vedam was going. He called me. I rushed. My shirt was crumpled. I was not at all. My hair was disheveled. I was not in a good shape. Then he said, where is your letter? Now, I had written a letter after my injury and I had kept it in my book. I had not given it to Swami and the book was where I was sitting. But when I went to Swami empty-handed, he asked me, where is your letter that you have written to me? So even before the letter is given to him, the letter has already reached him. But he wants us to have the satisfaction that we are giving him a letter. So I went back, removed the letter from the book, came to Swami, gave it to him. Then he said, again, baat karta hai, will you give a talk? By now, it was almost three years. I said, yes, I, I knew what that meant. I said, yes, Swami, I will give a talk. He said, okay, sit down. I will call you. So I went and sat down. Two other brothers spoke. I was profusely coughing, perspiring. I was very sick. Swami was continuously watching me. I thought maybe seeing my health, he decided not to call me. At around 4.50, 5.15 is bhajan time. And I thought Swami will get up and go inside for bhajans. At 4.50, Swami called me. And he said, haan, abhi jao, baat karo. I couldn't stand. He said, Lamba baat karo. Speak for a long time. He said, Shirdi, Parthi, sub stories batao. I said, I can't stand. I'm perspiring. I'm having fever. I'm coughing. And Swami wants me to stand and talk and talk for a long time. I said, Swami, how long? He said, Tum jao, mein batata hai. No question answers. Go and talk. I went there and started speaking. For 20, 25 minutes, I spoke. When I ran out of my last experience and thought, Swami said, Bas. I realized after I spoke for the 20-25 minutes, I had not coughed even once. I had not blanked out even once. I had not hesitated even once. And in that state of affairs, even without preparing, I had spoken to an audience of about 5,000 devotees for 25 minutes without any break. Then Swami called me, he materialized a ring for me, and he said, very happy. It didn't end there. I went back to hostel. I was again resting. That night I had a dream. I was sleeping in my room. Swami came there. I was not able to get up to take his namaskar because I had a back injury. Swami literally took me with both his hands, shook me in my dream and made me get up. And he put his hand on my head. He said, live a long life, healthy life, happy life, spiritually blessed life. From that day, my back and my health started recovering. It is the same Swami in different states of our own relationship with Him. Whether we see Him in a dream or we meet Him in person or we write a letter to Him in His omnipresence, it is the same Master who is functioning. We go back and again now I go back, so now the speech stories are over and I go back to a different facet and I told you about that green card. Now it was 2003, my renewal was due, I was in the second year of MBA. Now how do I tell Swami that I have to go to America to renew my green card? Such a, con such a complex technical uh, uh, subject to communicate, I didn't even know Telugu, telling him in English and explaining all these things. I, I thought it was a little difficult thing to do. But an opportunity appeared. There was an All India Vice Chancellor's Conference on Ethics and Education. And Prashant Lim was selected as the headquarters for that event. And there, 
I was selected among a set of eight students to give talks. 35 vice chancellors from different parts of India had come for the event. And uh, the University Grants Commission uh, chairperson had come for the event. It was a grand event in, in Prashantinilaya. And we were supposed to give talks in different languages. And there was supposed to be a rehearsal in Purnachandra Auditorium. So I went to Purnachandra Auditorium along with my uh, uh, bro other brothers who were selected for this event. And I had written a letter, Swami, I need to go to America for this reason. If you give permission, I will go. I had written all my uh, uh, requests for clarifications there. So I went there, sat there. Swami was sitting on the chair. I was sitting right near Swami's feet. I gave the letter. He read the letter and instantly he said, ah, go to America, go. Now when Swami instantly says something with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye, you know he means something which you need to ponder. So I kept on saying, no, Swami, I don't want to go, but this is a, a legal requirement. He said, ha, ha, go, go to America. I am telling you, go to America. Then he asked me, what is your mother saying? I said, Swami, mother is saying, what better opportunity than to stay with Swami? He said, okay, that is fine, but you go to America. Then after that was over, I sat down. Then Swami usually serves some kind of snacks for students. That day it was idli and chutney. We were eating right in front of Swami, Idli and Chutney. And then he was looking at me. He said, if you go to America, you will not get Chutney there. So everybody around me was laughing. They said, today Swami has nicely spiritually bullied him. And he is taking a nice class for him. So I was wondering, Chutney, Idli, America, what is happening? He didn't say anything after that. He smiled. The event got over. Incidentally, just to mention, after that event was over, after that session was over, our hands were still dirty. And that time Swami used to take help to get up. So he looked at two of us who were sitting in the first row and he said, hmm, means help me up, help me to get up. So then we looked at our hands which were jutha, right? We have eaten idli there. So he said, Swami, our hands are jutha. Again Swami said, hmm, help me. So with our jutha hands, we held his hand and he got up. When he got up, he smiled at us and looked at us and said, it is okay if the hands are jutha. Ensure that the heart always remains pure. That is very important because I reside there. So after that was over, I walked out. My class, my, one of my senior research scholars, he said, what Swami was telling? Idli chutney, idli chutney. So I explained to him the whole thing. He said, last year we had got an interview. In that also, Swami had served as idli and chutney. At, during the interview, Swami said, what is idli and what is chutney? So we all said, Swami, idli is big. So God is idli. And chutney is small, side dish. So world is chutney. Then Swami said, no, no. Without chutney, there is no value for idli. So God is chutney. And world is idli. So this research scholar told me, Swami has indicated to you that if you go to America, you will not get God. We have heard of Shirdi Baba giving all these indirect messages in, in his physical presence. The same thing continues in the next avatar as well. I decided that I am not going to go to America and I stayed back in Prashantinile. VC's conference, we gave the talk two days later. Very well received. Everybody was very happy. Swami was profusely blessing us, pulling our cheeks and all. We were so happy that we could make Swami happy. After all the program was over, when Swami was going back, we were surrounding him, five of us, four of us. And Swami said, I know since last two weeks you are working very hard to make Swami happy. I have been seeing you when you were doing your practice sessions in the hostel. Swami is indeed very happy. Come on, let us take photograph, he said. Then he turned around, looked at the cameraman and he said, photograph. And for literally 30 seconds with four of us around him, Swami was, uh, was posing for the photograph. After all photographs were over, Swami looked at the other direction and said, yes, one more, one more please. In English, Swami said, one more please for the photograph. Then again, he turned around and he said, he was going, he told some staff members, he said, these five students, there were four of us students and one sister student from Anantpur. He said, these five students spoke like the five human values and communicated my message to the vice chancellors and the devotees. I am very, very happy. 
Moving ahead, 2004, I finished my MBA. Now, eight months had passed. I was wondering. I have cancelled my opportunity to go to America. My father had made a lot of investments so that I go there because obviously you have to visit US often. It's quite an investment. My, my father had a desire that I should study there and all of that. I wanted to stay back because that was the indication Swami gave. Is Swami finally happy with my decision or not? It was 10th of June. I had gone home after two years for the vacation. I came back to uh, Prashant and Liam as soon as Swami returned. And Swami came there after morning darshan. We were old students sitting behind. Swami came there. And then Swami was speaking to some of us. Then he called me and he said, Abhi kya karta hai? I said, Swami, my MBA is over. MBA ho gaya. Immediately said, MBA ho gaya, PhD karo, PhD karo, PhD karo. He said six times, PhD karo. That morning when I was coming, I was telling my mother in the train, the Udyan Express, I said, I don't know when will I get instruction from Swami as to what I should do next. I want to stay with Swami, but Swami should also will so he should bless me. She said, why are you worrying? You leave it to Swami, it is his decision how he wants to bless you. Six hours later, Swami tells me six times, you do PhD. Then he calls me close to him. He said, Tum bol raha tha, foreign jata hai. Jata hai? You were saying you were going to go abroad. Are you going? This conversation happened in October 2003. This was June 2004. Eight months had passed. That was also the time when Swami was pretending that he is forgetting things. And here was Swami, eight months later, exactly telling me what he had told me in a casual interaction in Purnachandra Auditorium, when the average number of people Swami meets every day is about 500. I said, Nay Swami, I am not going. He said, Ha, very good, very happy, I am very happy. It didn't end there. One year later, 2005 May, I was in Kodai Canal with Swami, it blessed me to take me there. Swami uh, told me to get up and give a talk. He said, give a comparative analysis of the lives of Shirdi Baba and Satyasai Baba. Now, the, these were the demands that Swami used to make. At no, no, no time for preparation, instant talks. So I got up thinking, what will I speak there in the Sai Shruti Mandir? And there in, my, in front of my eyes, the lives of Shirdi Baba and Swami were parallelly playing and I could literally draw parallels between his lives as I was parallelly speaking. Later on, I realized how effortlessly I could bring about a comparative analysis with absolutely no preparation. It didn't end there. I sat down. Then Swami looked at the, devo the devotees and students sitting there. He said, this boy was going to go to America last year. Passport, visa, everything was ready. But last minute, he cancelled his visit. And he smiled. Nobody knew what Swami was talking about. I knew what he meant. One year, three months, six months, December 22nd, 2006. On 22nd November 2006, Swami blessed me with the MPhil gold medal. President of India, Dr. Abdul Kalam had come. And there on stage, Swami introduced me to Dr. Kalam. And there's a very memorable photograph of the three of us, which I always cherish. And... A month later, on 22nd December, I was sitting behind the bhajan hall and thinking, one month is over, Swami has not spoken to me, when will he talk to me? Those used to be the thoughts going on in the minds of all students. We were not interested what career prospects we have. We were not interested what job we will get. We were not interested what salaries we'll have. We were not interested whether we'll have an opportunity to get good experience or international exposure. We were only interested in one thing. When will Swami talk to us? When will Swami give Pad Namaskar? When will Swami accept the letter? When was the last time Swami spoke to us? This was the common problem with all students. It was literally a problem. But we later realized that that was the true devotion because we are always in the thoughts of God. That is the yearning which takes us closer to Him. So I was sitting there and one of my classmates came running. He said, Swami is calling you in the interview room. So from the backside of Bhajan Hall, I went there and then the interview room door opened. This, this classmate of mine was taller than me and I was standing behind me. But before that he said, Swami was asking for the boy who wanted to go to America. I did not know, the registrar knew. So he told that Swami, are you talking about Shashankar? Swami said, yes. 
Then I went into the interview room when the boy, when my classmate moved away, Swami saw me and Swami said, yes, this was the boy who wanted to go to America. He literally drilled this into my head so many times. And then we spoke so many things. I still remember there in that interview, Swami was talking to us. And then he mentioned to the vice chancellor that these five boys give very good speeches. I want to take them with me to the Atirudra Mahayagna in Chennai. Is it okay if they miss classes? Now imagine Swami who is the chancellor of the university is asking the vice chancellor whether it's okay that these students miss classes because I want to take them with me to Chennai. But protocol, discipline and institutional structures are very dear to Swami. He said, Vice Chancellor said, Swami, what better opportunity? Living with God is true education. Please take them with you. If you want, we will give permission to more students to accompany you. Swami said, okay, I will take these boys. Then Swami looked at Mr. Chakravarti, who was the secretary of the Central Trust. He said, tell Srinivasan, who was then the All India President, tell Srinivasan that these five boys speak very well. I want them to accompany me with in the flight to Chennai. Will he be able to make travel arrangements and ticket arrangements? Mr. Chakravarti said, Swami, I will immediately tell Mr. Srinivasan, definitely the boys can accompany you. But you imagine how much of humility and idealism that Swami places before us as we work in the Satasai Seva organization, that hierarchy, seniority, respect, responsibilities, each of, the, each of these need to be followed because that is the essence, the well-fueled machine that an organization is, which will work extremely well. 2007 May, again Swami blessed me to accompany him to Kodaikanal. Again I had given a speech that day, again I came back in the room, in that uh, Sai Shruti Mandir. By now I knew what is going to happen. Swami made me stand up and he asked Mr. G.K. Raman, the chairman of Sundaram Finance Company, he was a convener of uh, the Tamil Nadu State Trust. He said, do you know what this boy has studied? So Mr. G.K. Raman said, no Swami. So then Swami said, tell him what you have studied. So I said, Swami, I finished MBA. Then Swami repeated, see, he has finished MBA. Then I said, Swami, I finished MPhil. Then Swami repeated, see, he has finished MPhil also. Then I said, Swami, I am currently doing PhD. Then Swami said, see, now he is doing PhD. By the time Swami said that, he was almost choked. Swami said, this boy was going to go to America, but he stayed back with Swami. See how much he has studied. I am very happy with him. We always say you take one step towards God and God will take a hundred steps towards you. What does this mean? I had not taken any big step towards Swami. I had just implicitly tried to obey Him. But when you even implicitly obey Him, not worrying about what will happen to your future, He will ensure, and Swami always used to say, Annam kadu amrutam kuda istanu. Not only food, I will give you immortality. You need to surrender. Because that is what I expect. Implicit obedience, you should not apply your mind. And the greatest sadhana is to make God happy. I guess I learned both of these. That if we do a very small thing with a pure heart, with a genuine intention, Swami will be very happy. We move ahead, 10th of April 2007. It was a landmark day in, in terms of experiences. I had finished one month of my PhD and it is a tradition in India that you give your first salary to your mother. I said I want to give my first salary to my divine mother. So I wrote a letter, put the first salary notes inside that envelope, went to Swami's residence and gave the letter saying this is my gratitude letter and quickly, literally almost exited from them before there is any more question and answer. Because whether you do anything else or not, you should never ever dare as a student to give Swami money. That's the last thing he will appreciate. Swami used to get very upset. But my intention was very noble, so I took that chance and I came back to the bhajan hall, sat this time in the 20th row, 25th row, hiding myself, praying that Swami, please don't get angry because my genuine desire is to give you this stipend as my Divine Mother. Swami came for darshan. 
he finished his darshan came near the interview room he had got that envelope which i had given him from the residence he had given it to one of the senior devotees following him in the darshan line near the interview room he took that envelope from him came inside the bhajan hall with that envelope in his hand and said loudly announced shashank sha so i'm sitting in the 20th row not wanting to go ahead all people around me are nudging me go go swami is calling you with repetition in my heart i moved ahead kneel down in front of swami's chair and he said ye tum diya did you give this envelope i said yes swami then he said what is this i said swami this is my stipend this is my offering to you then he said no you should not give money to swami this is for your boarding and lodging expenses i don't want money if you want money i will give you but don't do like this he said that opened the envelope counted the notes that i had given him which was my stipend closed the envelope pulled my pocket in front put that envelope inside and said don't do like this again don't give money to swami then i was holding my hands like this and he looked at this ring he said did i give you this ring he said yes swami i said yes swami then he said why you put this small ring in front i said swami it is little loose he said oh it is loose for you then he waved his hand materialized one more ring and put it on my other finger he said see this is perfect size then he went sat in the throne i went behind sat on my place again he called me from there then he started saying to the students around him this shashank sha is got gold medal in mba this shashank sha is got gold medal in mphil this shashank sha he's got 5 out of 5 this shashank sha is a very good speaker speaker shashank sha shashank sha shashank sha i was wondering what has happened to swami why is he repeating my name so many times all of that got over i went and sat down in my place bhajan started and then it flashed in my mind one week earlier on my birthday 2nd of april is my birthday this was 10th of april i had written a letter to swami dr ravi kumar who is now the brindavan warden hostel warden he had told me when he was young swami always used to call him ravi kumar like that so he had written to swami once in the letter swami please don't call me ravi kumar call me ravi from that day for the next 30 years swami always used to call him ravi ravi so that gave me an idea swami never calls me by my name either he will say bombay boy or he will say fair boy or that boy who wanted to go to america or some such adjective he will use synonymous adjectives but he will never call me shashank so i wrote a letter to swami on 2nd of april that that day and in the darshan line where swami takes hundreds of letters i had given that letter and in that i had written swami please call me by my name you always you never call me by my name one week later when the opportunity came swami remembered that prayer and called me out shashank 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 at least a dozen times so much so that i had forgotten that prayer but in the thousands of prayers that he used to receive and in the thousands and thousands of devotees that he used to meet he remembered this small genuine prayer from the heart and fulfilled it this gave me the understanding that god will fulfill whatever you ask you better be careful what you ask because you will ask at a point in time and forget within a week's time you will forget what you asked him but he will remember and fulfill it you better be careful of the consequences of your prayer because you have asked for it that's why swami always used to say and he used to sing in tamil telugu oh mind don't ask leave it to me as to what leave it to god as to what it should give because standing on the shores of the sea you only know of the shells the treasures lie in the depth of the ocean standing at the doorstep of god you only know his external form the treasures lie within so leave it to him to give you whatever he thinks is best for you with the prayer let your will prevail in the same conversation that day and a third incident he was asking me what is your phd what are you doing when are you going to finish and all of that i said swami i'll finish in 3 years immediately he said no no not in 3 years finish in 2 and 1/2 years 
I said, okay, okay, Swami. I said, if you are saying I'll finish in two and a half years, I will need your grace. He said, yes, yes, my grace is there on you. You finish in two and a half years. Because Swami said, I tried my best, finish in two and a half years. On, 22nd of, on 21st of August 2010, on the Silver Jubilee of our university's business school, I offered the PhD to Swami in my research of over 100 interviews and about 1,100 surveys, the main finding was that employee value systems are the core for the success of any organization. So when I was mentioning that to Swami, I was telling him, Swami, you have mentioned the same thing 20 years back. And that is what my research has revealed. Swami had, has given almost 50 discourses to the business school students and the constant message in that has been that among the six M's of business, the first M, men, human beings, are the most important because they give value to the other five M's. Machines, minutes, material, money and methods. Men are more valuable than all the wealth of the world. I was amazed when last year, during one of the parliamentary session conversations, our current Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, also mentioned about the six M's where he said, Men are more valuable than other five M's. So what is the inner significance of this? Whatever we know of today, the scriptures, spirituality and the masters have revealed thousands and thousands of years ago. Swami has himself given so many, many insights which science has not yet been able to fathom. Swami has said that God is the basis of this creation. Just last year, after a multi-decade experience, the best of the scientists in this world discovered through the Higgs boson experiment of what is now called the God particle. And they said that this God particle is the trigger of this creation. Science is learning to run whereas spirituality has already galloped because spirituality is beyond the mind. Science is below the mind. And hence, science would benefit a lot if it learns from the spiritual insights and with an open mind tries to analyze them through the instruments that modern science and technology provides. Talking about spirituality, in Dasara of 2010, we had put together the fourth edition of My Dear Students, Lakshmi Khan mentioned about that series of books. In that, there was one discourse which spoke about the essence of the four Mahavakyas. Swami had given that discourse on 1st of January 1983. Now the four Mahavakyas emanate from the four Vedas. We were thinking this is extremely complicated. Students will not understand this. Should we include this in our book or not? Those were the thoughts that were going on in our mind. And then we said, no, Swami has given this discourse, so it should be included. Otherwise, Swami would not have given this discourse in the Prashantalam campus auditorium itself. So we included, but the intelligent people we think that we are, we put it as the last discourse, discourse number 18, the essence of the Mahavakyas. That day we went to Swami with the books, along with a few of Sai Publication students, it, I was also there, and we opened the book, we showed to Swami, Swami saw the pictures, then he saw the table of contents. He was going through the table of contents, and he went straight to the last discourse, put his finger under that discourse, which read essence of the Mahavakyas and indicated, open this page. So I went to the last part of the book, open this page. He smiled and then he literally put his finger below each of the four Mahavakyas and made the students who were there, the few of us, repeat it. Pragnanam Brahma, Ayam Atma Brahma, Tattvamasi, Sarvam Khaluvidam Brahma. These are the four Mahavakyas from the four Vedas. He literally made us repeat. And when we repeated, he was mighty happy. He blessed the book with Akshatas, closed it and moved ahead. And we were amazed. And when we came back to the hostel, we realized that we were thinking whether this discourse is going to be of relevance also or not, because this is hi-fi spirituality. Swami was interested only in that discourse, which meant that this is what Swami wants us to focus on. The message of the Vedas and Upanishads is the message that Swami wants his devotees and students to focus on. I always compare the Bhagavatam and the stories of the Lord are like the primary school. We all like to hear stories when we are children and the Bhagavatam tells a lot of stories. 
then the bhagavad gita which is the message of the lord is like higher secondary school from stories we move to concepts then the upanishads which give us the refined essence of all knowledge are like the college syllabus and then when you write a commentary on the brahma sutras you are conferred a phd just like you write your original thesis when you get phd this is the journey in our sai sadhana that we need to move from the leelas of the lord to the message of the lord to the identity of the lord and then the margins of the lord this is the four fold path that i understood that day that swami wanted us to practice we know what happened in april 2011 the physical form left us by the way in 22nd of november 2010 i got the phd from swami's hands i finished my phd i was the last student to get the phd from swami's hand 2011 swami left and that's when it struck me that three and a half four years ago swami had said don't take three years to finish your phd finish in two and a half years if i would not have finished in two and a half years as per swami's instruction i would not have got the phd from his own hands and we often think swami left his form it was a very abstract visit a, a abstract exit he had not planned his exit and so on and so forth there are dozens and dozens of examples which show that the avataric lifetime was planned with clockwork precision on 21st of february 1999 we were all sitting in purnachandra auditorium i was still not a student but some of my brothers have said and shared it's there even on the satyasai with students blog there was a purnachandra session going on and in some context swami's age came into picture instantly swami said don't be assured that i will be here till 96 if i want i can leave earlier also if i want i can stay longer also it is my will so don't take anything for granted this was one of the first public declaration swami made in 1999 one more thing happened in 2002 if you remember during the guru purnima swami had put that statue in the sai kolbant hall of himself it's very rare that in the lifetime of of the master of the guru of the avatar you have his own statue so we were all very concerned why swami has put the statue there even before the statue was to be installed it was in the purnachandra auditorium for cleaning and for decoration and all of that so two of those students who used to be assisting swami personally were looking at the statue and admiring it because it was very well done it's now in the chaitanya jyoti museum and they were looking at it with lot of joy and admiration as to how the artist and the sculptor has put together this statue in such a brilliant way because it's very difficult to get swami's features right especially when we've seen him and as we saw today there are lakhs of photographs of swami he must have been the most photographed spiritual leader ever in fact the london times had had acknowledged him as the most charismatic spiritual leader in 1975 so so uh, these two uh, student uh, not student they were working in swami's institution they were looking at swami's statue and talking about the beauty of the statue and then they didn't realize that swami was standing behind the curtain in purnachandra and he came out the auditorium was empty it was just a personal conversation and one of them mentioned this to me swami came out and said ha ah, now get used to seeing my statue so these two people got really concerned why is swami saying this and one of them has personally shared this with me why is swami saying this then they looked at swami he said swami you said that you will be here for 96 years so swami said what then he repeated he said swami you said that you will be here for 96 years then again swami said what when swami asks what two times you know that it's not that he has not heard but you have to reconfirm as to whether you are speaking the right thing but this boy again said swami you said swami said ha ah, i said that i will be here for 96 years now i am only saying that you better get ready to see this statue much earlier so there are so many and i have compiled at least a dozen of them but i wouldn't like to go into that there are so many of them which indicate swami's divine master plan but what after mahasamadhi there was a big void there was a pall of gloom that was on all of us as to how will we proceed with this mission and in april 2011 while swami was still in the physically in the hospital i got a dream 
in which Swami said, I was sitting and editing Swami's discourses, as Lakshmikan said, I was in charge of the publications division. And in the dream, all the students were sitting around and Swami had gone somewhere in the interview room and he came back and I didn't even pay attention that Swami was back. He was standing behind me. Everybody was looking at Swami and I was oblivious of his presence. Then I turned around and looked back and I saw Swami standing there in my dream and Swami said, ah, you have to ensure that my message is understood correctly, it is interpreted correctly and it is communicated in the right context. This is the threefold agenda that he gave in that dream. When we came back in June to the university, we were thinking whether we should continue with Swami's books compilation or not. But this dream reaffirmed and confirmed my conviction that Swami's message was even more necessary now than ever before because like in Sikhism they say, Guru, Guru hi maniyo granth your scriptural text is the very essence of the Guru's message. This text is the Guru in his physical form. In Swami's case, he has given 5,000 discourses. His discourses have become his living presence. So we continued and we brought out about 30 books which communicated Swami's message, conversations, experiences, all with respect to students and always ensured that it was interpreted in the right context. And even today, personally, it has been a very fulfilling exercise that I personally listen to Swami's discourse audio and ruminate over it to see what is the essence of Swami's message that we can apply from that in our daily lives. Moving forward and a couple of more experiences, I'll conclude this in the post-Samadhi era and how the same connection with Swami even continues now. In 2013, January, we put up a wonderful drama on the life and message of Sri Adi Shankaracharya. One of the foremost propounder of the Advaita Siddhanta, non-dualism. He is one of the most spoken about spiritual masters by Swami after the avatars and other than Jesus Christ. There are at least 30 discourses on the life of Sri Adi Shankaracharya given by Swami first and we have compiled some of them in one of the book called Saivani, Avatar on Mahapurushas available in Prashanti Nilayam. So we wanted to communicate the life of Adi Shankaracharya who in 32 years communicated the message of Sanatana Dharma across the length and breadth of India with no internet, with no train, with no car, with no plane, with his sheer determination as the messenger of the supreme principle so that Bharat Varsha may regain its divine destiny. In one of the discourses, Swami had mentioned that if Adi Shankaracharya would not have incarnated in India, India would have been an extension of the Chinese philosophy of atheism. That is the role and credit that Swami plays, pays to Adi Shankaracharya in the 8th century AD. So we wanted to communicate the message of this master. And while, I was while we were putting together, I was the uh, coordinator of that event, I was thinking to myself, some of us have also turned 32 Adi Shankaracharya lived for 32. Jesus Christ lived for 32. Swami has been giving so many messages about these great masters. What have we done in our lives having crossed or have reached 32 years of age? This was going on parallelly in some of our minds, especially in mine as I was leading the drama with no answer and no way to look, go to. Ten days after the drama was over, I had a dream. I was sitting with Swami in the interview room and Swami said, you are a researcher, isn't it? I said, yes, Swami. He said, what does a researcher do? And for those of us who do research, he said, a researcher first puts together the table of contents. These are the 10 things that I'm going to cover in this research project, in this research report, in this research proposal. After putting together those 10 points, the researcher focuses on each of these points, does research and puts together the research report. Similarly, in your life, you must put together your table of contents. What is it that I want to achieve in this lifetime? What are the 10 things that I want to accomplish? Then in your lifetime, focus on achieving each of those 10 points with utmost sincerity. Swami said, 
I am not interested in quantity. For me, quality is most important. Don't compare yourselves with anybody else. You give your best in your life. I woke up from that dream and I realized that such a customized message with my profession, with my background, with my query and with spirituality embedded in it in the highest way can only be done by that Swami who is constantly guiding us in our journey. The way the response comes then and now is always direct heart to heart and for each one of us directly reaching us. My, my elders in the university wanted me to join as a faculty in the Swami's university but I was waiting for some guidance from Swami as to whether I should join because Swami had always guided me as to what I should do next. It was the 1st of September. I told them that I'm waiting for some guidance from Swami. To, I'll, I'll wait for that. It was the 1st of September. I still remember that date. I, I was praying for many months. I said, Swami, please give me some guidance. What is it that you want me to do? I got a dream that night. Again, I was in the interview room with Swami. Swami looked, was looking at me and he said, I don't judge people by the number of years they stay in Prashanti Nilayam. I judge people by the commitment they show when they are in Prashanti Nilayam. Then he paused and he said, in my opinion, in your stay in Prashanti Nilayam, you have, you have shown 100% commitment. And then he indicated that after my postdoc, I should move out of the university and get experience. I was also writing a book on corporate social responsibility that time. And around the same time, the government of India, just to show how this whole jigsaw puzzle of our journey concludes, same time of, that same time, the government of India passed this act mandating CSR as compulsory. Around the same time, my book got released. I had sent my book to a number of universities for their feedback and opinion, including at Harvard University. And Harvard University, along with the World Bank, were coming up with an executive education program in February of 2014 in Mumbai. So when my book went there, one of the professors was very happy with the content and sent me an invitation, would you like to be a part of that workshop as a research faculty? So I was delighted because to work with an international institution is very encouraging and also very insightful. It's a great experience. So with the university's permission, Swami's university's permission, I came to Mumbai. It was at that time I came to know that that workshop was actually overdue since two years. It was delayed by two years and it was conducted in February 2014. At that time I got an invitation from the faculty in Harvard. We are wanting to do advanced research in corporate social responsibility. You have written a book. Would you like to do more research work with us? By then I had already got Swami's indication. So I said, okay, it will be a great opportunity, but only after I finish my postdoc. So they agreed. In April, I finished my postdoc and in May, I got the official letter. On 29th of April 2014, I got my tickets to leave Prashantinilayam from Udyan Express back to Bombay. I tried a lot to get a day later because I wanted to stay a few more days. But I just wouldn't get any other ticket. So we came back on 29th. Two weeks later, when I looked at the Indian almanac, the day as per the Indian calendar on 29th of April was Chaitra Amavasya. And the day I had joined Swami's university on 13th of May was Prathama of the Vaishakha. Exactly 12 years as per the Indian calendar, I was in Swami's university. Not one day more, not one day less. Every single aspect of our association with Swami's institutions is predetermined. What is important is between the starting and ending date, whether of our role, our position, our geog geographic presence, or of our lifetime, what we do between, in between these two dates is the most important. On 13th of September 2014, I landed in US, in Boston, 15th September, I was going to join the Harvard Business School. That early morning, 
I get a dream of Swami. I'm sitting in the Kulvan, in the Kulvan Hall. Swami comes walking. He comes to me. He smiles at me. He pats my back. He speaks something to me, nods his head in happiness and moves ahead. When I wake up, I realize today I'm joining a new institution after my stay at Swami's university for 12 years. So Swami came to give me darshan, sparshan and sambhashan as a commencement of a new journey. Not only that, it took me back 12 years when in June 2002, Swami had said in the dream, this boy wanted to go to Harvard University, but he wanted to be with Swami, so he has come here and hence I have kept, it in, kept him in Prashantinilayam. Between these two dreams, a journey of 12 years in the physical presence and the divine presence of Swami had groomed me, molded me, inspired me, transformed me to play a responsible role in his mission, which he expects each one of us as students and devotees who are associated with the Satisai mission. I conclude with this theme of Samarpan. What is Samarpan? Samarpan means offering. Offering of what? In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, four things is what I want you to offer to me. Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam. I want leaf, I want flower, I want fruit, and I want holy water. Very easy to give these because available in the market. You pay 50 rupees and you'll get a whole basket of these four things. And that's what is sold outside most temples. But what is the inner significance of Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam? If it was so easy to buy it, why did Krishna tell Arjuna that I want these four things? And Swami has given the inner significance. What is Patram, Pushpam, Phalam, Toyam? Patram means your body. I want you to dedicate your body. Pushpam means your feelings. I want you to dedicate your feelings. Phalam means mano phalam, your mind. I want you to dedicate your mind to me. And Toyam, holy water means the bliss, the joy that emanates from your heart when we see Swami's beautiful form, when we experience His love, that is the holy water that He wants us to offer to Him. That is the true Samarpan. What is the dearest offering to Swami that we can make? We always think that Swami expects all the things that we think are dear to Him. And I would like to read one small excerpt from His discourse given on Feb. 19th, 1970 at Prashant in Ilayam. And Swami says, The Lord is now worshipped by offering Him all things that you crave for, by treating Him with all the honour that you like to be done to yourself. The idol is bathed and washed, bedecked with jewels, fed and fanned, surrounded with fragrance. Since these are the things that you desire as a human being. But the Lord is pleased only when you do things the Lord desires. And what does He desire? How else can you win His grace? How else than by nursing and nourishing, succoring and saving His children? How else than by helping them to realize Him as their inner Lord and guardian and cultivating faith in Him through your own straight and sincere living? This is the essence of the Samarpan that Swami expects in each one of our lives. If we look at Swami's message, and I conclude with that, in 1950, Swami established an ashram in Prashantinilayam. And for 60 years, He showed how an ideal ashram should be run. In 1960s, He started the Seva organization. And for 50 years, he showed how an ideal socio-spiritual organization should be run. In 1970s, he started the trust. And for 40 years, showed how the trust should be run, how a social welfare trust should be run. In 1980s, he started the university and showed and how, how an ideal, secular, spiritual university should be run. In 1990s, he started the healthcare project. And for two decades, he showed how a humanized healthcare system should be run. In the 2000s, he revived Sanatana Dharma through proactive chanting, study, and understanding of the Vedas. And in that decade, he showed how we must live our lives as per Sanatana Dharma. 
what better example that we have than learning and living the life that Swami has laid before us. In a lifetime of 85 years, Swami has inspired millions of people 600,000 active workers in Satisai Seva organization alone in India and an equal number abroad in 125 countries with 2,000 centers. 700 crores spent for supplying water to 20 million people, which is equivalent to the population of some of the countries in Europe. 700 crores spent for providing free health care to 25 lakh outpatients in 20 years across four hospitals. 5,000 discourses that we gave to devotees, students, experts, lawyers, educationists, healthcare specialists, prime ministers, presidents. Incidentally, in Swami's lifetime, he has personally interacted and inspired eight prime ministers and five presidents of this glorious country. That is the kind of impact that he has had in his lifetime, where he has touched millions of people. What is our role in this glorious mission? In one interview, Swami had said, what is the greatest thing that can happen to human beings? And students gave different answers. Self-realization, moksha, etc., etc. At the end, and as Swami always has the last word, Swami said, no, no, no. This is easy because the ant also will reach the atma. The ant will also reach the Atma because that is its destiny. It only requires self-effort. The rarest and the greatest opportunity is to be the contemporary of the avatar. Not only be the contemporary of the master, but also be getting an opportunity to see him and be in his physical presence. Not only that, but to listening his message. Not only that, understanding his message. And not only leaving it at that, practicing his message and participating in his mission. That is the rarest of the rare opportunity that any human being can ever have. I would like to humbly submit as I conclude that that is the opportunity which each one of us have been blessed with. In this world which has nearly 650 crore people I would leave the statistics and its related analysis to all of us as to what small number, though quite large, do we belong to and how blessed we are. The only two objectives that we have before us, as Swami often has placed, Atmano Mokshartham Jagathitayacha. Work towards yourself in emancipation, contribute to the welfare of the society, and do your role well. Because when this show of this world ends, and we go backstage where the divine director is standing to give us a compliment or a comment about our role in this show of this world. He should pack our, pat our back and say, Chala Santosham, I am very happy with your work. Jai Sairam.